Thank you. Thanks very much. Good evening. Uh, I was told by the old headmaster that I'm going to watch you. Be careful. Ten minutes, you are out. You're gone. So uh, I'm being watched. Big Brother is watching over me. <laughs> For the first time, it will have an effect in the NIK. A few days, in fact, hours before I, I came out here, I, was, I got this email and said, could you, a few of you as Africans from Sub-Sahara, you know, put a, a paper together or a report on, we're impressed by the way, by the rate of the church growth in your part of the world. Can you share with us uh, the successes, the innovations uh, that have registered these high numbers of church growth and as well as the challenges. So we promptly came together yesterday and this afternoon and put up one or two things. And this is what I'm, gonna, uh, what I'm going to talk about um, today, uh, tonight. It's just a short description of the training challenges and successes or innovations that um, we are experiencing across our countries, uh, which has seen much historical growth among the brethren churches in the sub-Saharan um, Africa. Uh, I'm sure you'll be aware that um, there's been a great shift in terms of church growth or missiology from the global north to the global south, as we heard yesterday from, from Ian. And I just want to look at, first of all, the challenges. We have more challenges than successes. And I'll run through these very, very um, quickly. Uh, first of all, it's basically the ill-equipped libraries. You know, we, we, we do not have resources. We do have libraries. In some colleges, actually, do not have um, some of the key textbooks that they need to teach uh, very key um, topics or subjects. So uh, as I shared with my friends, I discovered that's one of the challenges, ill-equipped libraries, and then secondly, the training facilities in general, the infrastructure, you know, uh, in many places still leaves much to be desired. So there's need to develop the infrastructure so that, you know, you have a very good learning um, um, uh, environment or teaching environment. And then we do have the internet connectivity and electricity challenges. Do you know the internet in Africa is very exciting. One moment it works, the next moment it just drops out. Do you know, I remember even trying to fill the, line, you know, the forms online for my visa to, to travel here. I don't know how many times I was, how long I was online. You know, it kept dropping off and dropping off and dropping off. You know, if you are in Angola, when you have electricity, you do everything within that one hour because you don't know when you will lose power. You know, so those are some of the challenges that we have. And then we have the limited financial resources. You know, I dare not uh, emphasize, uh, overemphasize this point. Very limited um, financial um, resources. Uh, then lack of African theological writings. A lot of our textbooks have been written by Western theologians. And so everything has been uh, seen, interpreted, and understood within the eyes of the North, uh, or rather the Western theologians. So there's need for us as Africans to begin writing, you know, and trying to grapple with our own theologies, so to speak, you know. So, and I want to encourage, one of the challenges I bring forth to us here as Africans, for my friends, is to begin to put to paper some of the issues that we're having to grapple with in the area of, of, of theology and uh, you know, social uh, concerns and politics and so on and so forth. We don't have much time to go through that list. Then the limited and adequately trained African trainers, especially at postgraduate level, you know, supported and organized by full-time workers, lecturers, and, and instructors. What I'm basically saying is that we need to have a think tank of Africans you know, theologians will be able to grapple with the issues that Africa is going through at the moment, you know, HIV and AIDS and so on. A lot of books have been written by guys who have come from the Western world and they have studied us, you know, and um, studied our situations and they've come back here to their colleges and universities, written their theses and have their degrees given to them. And when we read the books, we see ourselves through their lenses. And sometimes we say, well, that doesn't sound like us, doesn't look like us, 
You know, so we need a think tank of Africans who come together and be able to uh, grapple with the issues that the church in Africa is, 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 is grappling with. And then the seventh challenge is the lack of networking, networking rather, amongst the colleges. Lack of networking amongst the colleges. This is okay. We can come here, you know, and it's been organized by our friends from the West, and we come and meet each other, and the next time we we'll fold our hands until after four years we we'll come again and we we'll meet again and then leave. One of the things I've been trying to do in Africa, I've been given the responsibility of bringing together trainers in Africa. We tried to do that during the last uh, Pan-African conference in Kenya and we came up with an action plan and I've sent my friends these emails. I've never had a response from them. Where that's the problem of connectivity, I'm not too sure. But I think we need to think very, very seriously, maybe of having something like this within Africa. So we can begin to share our, our resources, our ideas, and so on and so forth. And then eight, number eight is a dependence on Global North Church for, for support. We're always, you know, putting our hands up to the Western Church, help us, help us. But I tell you what, Africa has got so many resources, has got its resources. It's a matter of simply what we can do, it's a matter of simply, you know, organizing and mobilizing these resources and putting our priorities right. You know, we can make it. But of course, we still have the need to, there's still the need for us to uh, partner in the area of sharing the, the resources. And then number nine is some relational culture trends. You know, this, this, what do I mean by that? You know, because Africans are basically very relational, sometimes it becomes very difficult to confront a colleague who you think really must pull up their socks, you know? Uh, because we're not very confrontational, we find it very hard to say to, 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 to my friend here, I can say, okay, my friend Vijay, look here, I think you need to do the following things, otherwise you're out of here. That doesn't usually happen, you know? And so you go about, about the bush and trying to be nice and polite to them eventually, and consequently, actually, the work suffers. Number 10 is the, we need contextualized discipleship. The, the discipleship model that we have has been fed to us by the Western church. For example, you know, Africans are very communal. And the most effective way to disciple Africans is to bring them together, not one-to-one. Because we're not a privatized you know, uh, a community. Our lives are, are not that private. We draw energy from each other. You know? And so for effective discipleship is to bring Africans together, a group of people together, and then they see themselves as being accountable to God primarily, but also to one another. And they draw energies from each other. And then, is that the last one? No, I think this is the last one. A fortress mentality, unwilling to accept change, tradition versus doctrines. That's very, very straightforward. Let me just move on to the last slide and look at some of the successes, you know? The church growth, community life, trainers being practical, and so on. We challenge our people to be very practical. You teach, you say to the students, now let's go out and do it, you know? Let's go out and do it. In fact, some colleges I understood that they will never let their student graduate before they plant two churches. How about that? Relational community. You know, we, 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 we like interacting. We, we find it easy to talk to people. You have a conversation about the rain, about the sun, about politics, and eventually it develops into, you know, a religious conversation. You begin to ask people whether they're Christians or not. You know, you don't need to get their permission to do that. You know, and, 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 and people are much more than willing and ready to respond. They don't feel threatened when you ask them spiritual questions. A focus on missions and evangelism done in training and oral discipleship is quite related to, to, to number two. But then what we're saying there, there's a deliberate focus involved in, in missions. It's not just the theory, but then you become very practical as well. I think my, maybe my time is up, so on. So I'm actually looking at that watch, David, and I still have two minutes. 
So. <laughs> My son is not good. Oh, okay. The communal discipleship model. And I think I mentioned that. And what's the last one? Community social intervention, integral ministries. You know, as we get involved with some of the social concerns, social evils in the, in the, in the community, HIV and the AIDS and so on and so forth, widows and widowers and helping them and street kids, we're able to share the gospel that way. And because there's a, there are a lot of felt needs in our community, you know, as you address these self-needs, people see that you're concerned for them. And so what happens is that they're able to, very, to, to listen to the gospel as you share that with them.